Berkshire Hathaway Incorporated. The shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway Incorporated are gaining net worth during 2003 was $13.6 billion, which increased the Berkshire book value of both our Class A and Class B stock by 20% over the last 39 years. That is, since present management took over, Berkshire book value has grown from $19 to $50,498, a rate of 22.2% compounded annually. All the issues in this report apply to Berkshire's A shares, as etc. to the only stock that the company had outstanding before 1996. The B shares have an economic interest equal to one thirtieth that of A. It's Berkshire intrinsic value that counts it, and however, not book value. Here, the news is good between 1964 and 2003. Berkshire imports from a struggling northern textile business whose intrinsic value is less than book and too widely diversified enterprise worth far more than book or a nine year gain in intrinsic value has served for somewhat exceeded our 22.2% gain in book for a uh, better understanding of intrinsic value and the economic principles that guide Charlie Munger, my partner and Berkshire Vice Chairman, and me, Aaron and Berkshire, please read our owner's manual beginning on page 69. Despite their shortcomings, book value calculation are useful Berkshire is slightly understand gauge for measuring the long-term rate of increase in our intrinsic value. The calculation is less relevant, however, than the ones that wasn't raising any song year's performance versus the S&P 500 index. A comparison with display on the facing page. <clears throat> Our equity holdings, including convertible preferreds, have fallen considerably as a percentage of our net worth from an average of 114% in the 1980s, for example, to an average of 50% in the 2000s, 03. Therefore, usually moving into the stock market, it will affect a much smaller portion of our net worth than when it was the case. Nonetheless, Berkshire's long-term performance versus the S&P remains all important. Our shareholders can buy the S&P through an index fund at a very low cost unless we achieve gains in per share intrinsic value. In the future, that would outdo the S&P's performance. Charlie and I will be adding nothing to what you can accomplish on your own. If we fail, we will have no excuse. Charlie and I operate an ideal environment. To begin with, we are supported by an incredible group of men and women who run our operating units. If there were corporate co- coppers down, its roster would surely include many of our CEOs. Any shortfall in Berkshire's results will not be caused by our managers. Additionally, we enjoy a rare sort of managerial freedom. Most companies are saddled with institutional constraints. A company history, for example, may commit to an industry that now offers a limited opportunity. A more common problem with shareholder gets us to and see their partners as managers to dance Wall Street's tune. Many CEOs resist, but other gives an adapt operating capital allocation policies far different from those they would choose if left to themselves. At Berkshire, neither history nor the demands of owners impede intelligent decision-making. When Charlie and I make mistakes, they are in tennis parlance and forced errors. When valuations are similar, we strongly prefer owning business to owning stocks. During most of our years of operation, however, stocks were much a cheaper choice. We therefore search Charlie tilted our asset allocation in those years toward equities as illustrated by the percentage cited earlier. In recent years, however, we found it hard to find, find significantly undervalued stocks. A difficulty greatly accentuated by mushrooming of the funds, we must apply the idea number Number stocks. <clears throat> It can be purchased in large enough quantities to move the performance needle at Berkshire as a small fraction of the number that existed a decade ago. Investment managers often profit far more from piling up assets than from handling those assets well, so when one tells you to increase funds, won't hurt his investment performance step back. His nose is about to grow. The short gauge of uh, uh, the shortage of attractively priced stocks into which we can put large sums doesn't bother us, providing we can find companies that purchase that, one, have favorable and enduring economic characteristics, two, are run by talented and honest managers, and three, are available at a sensible price. We have purchased a number of such businesses in recent years, though not enough to fully employ the gusher of cash that has come our way. In buying business, we have made some terrible mistakes, both over commission and omission. Overall, however, our acquisitions have led to decent gains and per share earnings. Below the table, it quantifies that point, but first we need to warn you that growth rate presentations can be significantly destroyed by a calculated selection of either initial or terminal dates, for example. If of either initial or terminal dates, for example, for earnings or tiny in the beginning year, a long-term performance that was only mediocre can be made to appear sensational. That kind of distortion can come about because the company at issue was a minuscule in the base year, which means that only a handful of insiders will actually benefit from the touted performance, or because a large company was in operating at just above break-even. Pickle on terminal year that is particularly buoyant will also fare well by a calculation of growth. The Berkshire Hathaway, their presence management assumed control of in 1965, had long been sizable, but 1964 had earned only 175,578 six dollars or 15 cents per share, so close to break even that any calculation of earnings growth from that, that base would be meaningless at that time. However, even those meager earnings looked good. Over the decade following 1955, Merger of Berkshire, Fine Spinning Associates, and Hathaway Manufacturing, the combined operation had lost $10.1 million, and many thousands of employees had been let go. It was not a marriage made in heaven. Against this background, we give you a picture of Berkshire's earning growth that begins in 1968, but also includes subsequent base years spaced five years apart. A series of calculations presented so that you can decide for yourself which period is most meaningful. After 
started with 1968 because it was the first full year of operated national indemnity that initial acquisition we made as we expand to expand Berkshire's business. I don't believe that using 2003 as terminal year distorts our calculations. It was a terrific year for our insurance business, but the big boost that gave to the earnings was largely off, was set by the pathetically low interest rates. We earned our dollar show than cash equivalents, a condition that will not last all figures shown below. It should be long to exclusive capital games. Year 1964, 1968, 1973, 1978, 1983, 1988, 1993, 1998, 2003. Operating earnings in millions. Dollars. 0.2, 2.7, 11.9, 30.0, 48.6, 313.4, 477.8, 1,277.0, 5,422. 0.0, operating earnings per share in dollars. <coughs> Point fifteen, two point sixty nine, twelve point eighteen, twenty nine point fifteen, forty five point sixty, two hundred seventy three point thirty seven, four hundred thirteen point nineteen, one thousand twenty four point forty nine, three thousand five hundred thirty one point thirty two. Subsequent compounded growth rate per share earnings, not meaningful, ninety sixty four to two thousand three, twenty two point eight percent, ninety sixty eight to two thousand three, twenty point eight percent, ninety seventy three two thousand three, twenty one point one percent, ninety seventy two thousand three, ninety four point three percent, nineteen eighty three two thousand three, nineteen eighty six, nineteen eighty eight to two thousand three, twenty three point nine percent, nineteen ninety three to two thousand three, twenty eight point two percent, nineteen ninety eight to two thousand three. We'll continue the capital allocation practices we have used in the past as stocks become significantly cheaper than the entire business. We'll buy them aggressively selected bonds become attractive as they did in 2002. We'll again load up on these securities under any market or economic conditions. We'll be happy to buy business that meet our standards and for those that do, the bigger the better a capital is underutilized now, but that will happen periodically. It's a painful condition to be in, but not as painful as doing something stupid. I speak from experience. <clears throat> Overall, we are certain Berkshire's performance in the future will fall short of what it has been in the past. Nonetheless, Charlie and I remain hopeful that we can deliver results that are mo- modestly above average. That's what we're being paid for. Acquisitions. As a regular reader, no, our acquisitions have often come about in strange ways. None, however, had a more usual genesis than our purchase last year of Clayton Homes. The unlikely source was a group of finance students from the University of Tennessee and their teacher, Dr. Al Oxier. For the past five years, Al, Al has bought his class to Omaha, where the group tours Nebraska Furniture Mart and Boris Hems eats at Chorus and comes to Kiewit Pizza for a session with me. Usually, we about 40 students participate. After two hours of give and take, the group traditionally presents me with a thank you gift. The doors stay locked until they do. In past years, it's been items such as football signed by Phil Fulmer and a basketball from Tennessee's famous women's team. This past February, the group opted for a book, which luckily for me was a recently published autobiography of Jim Clayton, founder of Clayton Homes. I already know the company, the class I have manufactured my housing industry knowledge. I acquired after earlier making the mistakes of buying homes some distressed junk debt of Oakwood Homes, one of the industry's largest companies at the time of the purchase. I did not understand how atrocious consumer financing practices had become throughout most of the manufactured housing industry, but I learned Oakwood rather promptly went bankrupt. Manufactured housing and should be emphasized can deliver very good value to home purchasers. And for decades, the industry has accounted for more than 15% of the homes built in the U.S. during those years. Moreover, both the quality and var- varied variety of manufactured houses consistently improved. <clears throat> Progress in design and construction was not matched, however, by progress in distribution and financing. Instead, as the years went by, the industry's business model increasingly centered on the ability of both a retailer and manufacturer to unload terrible loads on native lenders. Once securitization then became popular in the 1990s, further distancing the supplier funds from the late lending transaction, the industry conduct went from bad to worse. Much of its volume a few years back came from buyers who shouldn't have bought financed by lenders who shouldn't have lent. The consequence has been huge numbers of repossessions and politically low recoveries and units per Oakwood participated fully in the insanity to be with Clayton, though it could not isolate safe from the industry practice and behave considerably better than its major competitors. Upon receiving Jim Clayton's book, I told the students how much I admired his record, and they took that message back to Knoxville, home of both the University of Tennessee and Clayton Holmes. Alden suggested I can call Kevin Clayton, Jim's son, and the CEO to express my views directly. As I talked with Kevin, it became clear that he was both able and straight shooter. Soon thereafter, I made an offer for the business based solely on Jim's book by evaluation of Kevin, the public financial of Clayton, and when I learned from the Oakwood experience, Clayton's board was receptive since it understood that the large-scale financing Clayton would need in the future might be hard to get. <clears throat> Lenders had to flood the industry of insecurizations when possible, and it all carried far more expensive and restrictive terms than was previously the case. This tightening was particularly serious for Clayton, whose earnings significantly depended on securitizations. Today, the manufactured housing industry remains a wash in problems. Delinquencies continue higher up as the units still abound. The number of retailers have been halved. A different business model is required, one that eliminates the ability of the retailer and salesman to pocket substantial money up front by making sales finance loans that are destined to default. Such transactions cost hardship to both buyers.
buyer and lender and lead, lead to Flanders repossessions that don't undercut the sale of new units under a proper model when requiring significant down payments and shorter term loans. The industry will likely remain much smaller than it was in the 90s, but it will deliver to home buyers an asset to ensure they will have equity rather than disappointment upon resale. In the full circle department, Clayton has agreed to buy the assets of Oakwood. When the transaction closes, Clayton's manufacturing capacity geographically reach and sales outlets will be substantially increased as by product the depth of Oakwood that we own, which we bought at a deep discount, will probably return a small profit to us. And the students, in October, we had a surprise graduation ceremony in Knoxville for the 40 who sparked my interest in Clayton. I donned a mortar board and presented each student with both a PhD for phenomenal hardworking dealmaker from Berkshire and a Beecher all got an A share. If you meet some of the new Tennessee shareholders at our annual meeting, give them your thanks and ask them if they have read any good books lately. In early spring, Byron Trott, a managing director of Goldman Sachs, told me that the Walmart wishes sell its McLean subsidiary. McLean distributes groceries and non-food items, convenience stores, drug stores, wholesale clubs, mass merchandisers, quick service restaurants, theaters, and others. It's a good business, but one not in the mainstream of Walmart's future. It's made to order, however, for us. <clears throat> McLean has a sale of about $23 billion but operates on paper thin margins about 1%. Pre tax in most small Berkshires, sales figures far more than our income. In the past, some retailers had shut McLean because it was owned by their major competitor, Grady Rosier. McLean's superb CEO has already landed some of these accounts. He was in full stride today. The deal closed and more will come. For several years, I have given my vote to Walmart in the balloting for Fortune's magazine, most admired list. Our McLean transaction reinforced my opinion. To make the McLean deal, I had a single meeting of uh, two hours with Tom Show, Walmart CFO, and we then shook hands. He did, however, first call Bentonville. 29 days later, Walmart has its money with no due diligence. We know everything would be exactly as Walmart said it would be and was. I should add that Byron has now been instrumental in three Berkshire acquisitions. He understands Berkshire far better than any investment banker with whom he have talked and it hurts me to say this. Er Earns his fee. I'm looking forward to deal number four, as I'm sure is he... Taxes on May 20, 2003, the Washington Post ran an op-ed piece by me that was riddled with Bush tax proposal. 13 days later, Pamela Olson, Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy at the U.S. Treasury, delivered a speech about the new tax legislation, saying, That means a certain Midwestern oracle who, it must be noted, hasn't played the tax code like a fiddle, is still safe or in all things. I think she was talking about me. I'll ask my fiddle playing will not get me to Carnegie Hall or even to high school recital, Berkshire on your behalf and mine, will send the Treasury $3.3 billion, billion dollars on tax at 2003 income, a sum equaling 21.5% of the total income tax paid by all the U.S. Corporation fiscal 2003. In contrast, Berkshire market valuation is about 1% of the value of all American corporations. Our payment will almost certainly place us among our country's top 10 taxpayers. Indeed, if only 540 taxpayers pay the amount of Berkshire, will pay. No other individual corporation will have to pay anything to Uncle Sam. That's right, $290 million dollars of American Americans and other business would not have to pay a dime in income, social security, excise, or estate taxes to the federal government. Here's the math. Federal tax receipts, including social security receipts in fiscal 2003, totaled $1 million $1.782 trillion and 500 shire, 540 British shares, each paying $3.3 .3 billion would deliver the same $1.782 trillion. Our federal tax return for 2002-2003 is not finalized when we paid $1.75 billion covered of mere 8,905 pages. As is required, we dutifully filed two copies of this return, creating a pile of paper seven feet tall at World Headquarters, a small band of 15.8. Though exhausted, momentarily flushed with pride, Berkshire, we felt were surely pulling its share of our country's fiscal load. But Miss also sees things otherwise, and if it means Charlie and I need to try harder, we are ready to do so. I do wish, however, that Miss Alton would give me some credit for the progress I've already made in 1944. I filed my first 1,040 reporting. My income as a 13-year-old newspaper carrier. The return covered three pages after I claimed the appropriate business deduction is $35 for a bicycle. My tax bill was $7.1. Send my check to the Treasury and would comment promptly, cash it, we lived in peace. I can understand why the Treasury is now frustrated with corporate America and prone to outbursts, but it should look to Congress and the administration for the dress not, break, to break, not to break share. Corporate income taxes in fiscal 2003 accounted for 7.4% of all federal tax receipts, down from a post-war peak of 3.2% in 1952, with one exception. 1983, last year, percentage is the lowest record since data was first published in 1934. Even so, tax breaks for corporations and their investors 
sectors, particularly large ones, were a major part of the administration's 2002-2003 initiatives. If class warfare is being waged in America, my class is clearly winning. Today, many large corporations run by CEOs whose fiddle playing talents make your chairman look like he is all thumbs, pay nothing but close to the stated federal tax rate of 35%. In 1985, Berkshire paid $130 million in federal income tax and all corporations paid $61 billion. The comparable amounts in 1995 were $286 million to $157 billion, respectively. And as mentioned, we will pay about... $3.3 billion for 2003, a year when all corporations paid $132 billion. We hope our taxes continues to rise in the future. It will mean we are prospering, but we also hope that the rest of corporate America ends up along with us. This might be a project for Ms. Olson to work on. Corporate Governance. In judging whether corporate America is serious about reforming itself, CEO pays remains the acid test. To date, the results aren't encouraging. A few CEOs, such as Jeff Immelt of General Electric, have led the way in initiating programs that are fair to managers and shareholders alike. Generally, however, his example has been more admired than followed. It's understandable how pay got out of hand when management has employees or when companies bargain with the vendors and intensity of interest is equal on both sides of the table. One party's gain is the other party's loss, and the money involved has real meaning to both. The result is an honest-to-God negotiation. But when CEOs or representatives have have met with compensation committees too often one side, the CEOs has cared far more than the other about what bargain has struck. A CEO, for example, will always regard the difference between receiving options for 10,000 shares for, or for 500,000 as monumental to a comp committee. However, the difference may seem important, particularly if it has been the case that most companies neither grant will have any effect on reported earnings under these conditions. The negotiation often is a play money quality. Overreaching by CEOs greatly accelerated in the 1990s as a compensation package gained by the most avaricious, a title for which there was vigorous competition were promptly replicated elsewhere. The couriers for this epidemic of greed were usually consultants in human relations departments, which had no trouble perceiving who buttered their bread as one compensation consultant commented. There are two classes of clients you don't want to offend, actual and potential. In proposal for performing, there's malfunctioning system. The cry has been for independent directors, but the question of what truly motivates independence has largely been neglected and Last year's report, I took a look at how independent directors as defined by statute is performed in the mutual fund field. The Investment Company Act of 1940 mandated such directors, and that means we've had an extended test of what statutory standards produce. In our examination last year, we looked at the records of fund directors in respect to the two key tasks board members should perform, whether it's mutual fund business or any other. These two all-important functions are first to obtain or attain an able honest manager and then to compensate that manager fairly. Our survey was not encouraging. Year after year, literally thousands of fund directors had routinely rehired the incumbent management company. However, pathetic its performance had been. This was routinely the directors had mindlessly approved fees that in many cases far exceeded those that could have been negotiated. Then when a management company was sold invariably at a huge price relative to tangible assets, the director experienced a counter-revelation. It immediately signed on with a new manager and accepted its fee schedule. In effect, the directors decided that whoever would pay the most from the old management company was a part that should manage shareholders' money in the future. Despite the lapdog behavior of the independent fund directors, we did not conclude that they are bad people. They're not. But sadly, boardroom atmosphere almost invariably sedates their fiduciary genes. On May 22, 2003, not long after Berkshire reported, appeared the chairman of the investment company Institute to address its membership about the state of our industry. Responding to those who have weighed in about our perceived failings, he mused, it makes me wonder what life would be like if we'd actually done something wrong. Be careful what you wish for. Within a few months, the world began to learn that many fund management companies had followed policies that hurt the owners of the fund they managed while simultaneously boosting the fees of the managers. Prior to the transgressions, it should be noted, these management companies were earning profit margins and returns on 10 equity that were the envy of corporate America, yet the sole profits further they trampled on the interest of fund shareholders in an appalling manner. So what are directors of these looted funds doing? As I write this, I have seen none that have terminated the contract of the offending management company, though naturally that entity has often fired some of its employees. Can you imagine directors who have been personally defrauded taking such a boys will be boys attitude? To top it all off, at least one miscrent management company has put itself up for sale, that undoubtedly hoping to receive a huge sum for delivering their mutual funds. It has managed to have the highest bidder among other managers. This is a travesty. Why in the world don't the directors of those funds simply select whomever they think is the best among the bidding organizations and sign up with that party directly? The winner would consequently be spared a huge payoff to to the former manager who have been flouted, the principles of stewardship deserves not a dime, not having to bear that acquisition cost. The winner could surely manage the funds in question for a far lower ongoing fee than would otherwise have been the case. Any truly independent director should insist on this approach to obtaining a new manager. 
The reality is that neither the decades old rules to regulate investment company directors nor the new rules bearing down on corporate America fostered the election of truly independent directors in both instances, and individuals receiving 100% of his income from director fees and who may wish to enhance his income through election to other boards is deemed independent. That is nonsense. The same rules say that the British director and lawyer Ron Olson, who received from us perhaps 3% of his average large income, does not qualify as independent because that 3% comes from legal fees. British pays him firm rather than from fee he earns as a British director. Rest assured, 3% from any source would not torpedo Ron's independence, but getting 20% to 30% or 50% of their income from director fees might well temper the independence of many individuals, particularly if their overall income is not large. Indeed, I think it's clear that the mutual funds, it has. Let me make a small suggestion to independent mutual fund directors. Why not simply affirm in each annual report that, one, we have looked at other management companies and believe that, one, we have retained for the upcoming years is among the better operations in the field, and two, we have negotiated a fee with our managers comparable to what other clients with equivalent funds would negotiate. It does not seem unreasonable for shareholders to expect fund directors who are often receiving fees that exceeds $100,000 annually to declare themselves on these points. Certainly, these directors would satisfy themselves on both matters were they handling over a large chunk of their own money to managers and directors are unwilling to make these two declarations shareholders should head heed the maxim if you don't know whose side someone is on he's probably not yours finally disclaimer a great many funds have been run well and consensuously despite the opportunities for malfeasance that excess shareholders of these funds have benefited and their managers have earned their pay indeed if i were director of certain funds including some that Char- charge above average fees, I would enthusiastically make the two declarations I've suggested. Initially, those index funds that are very low cost, such as Vanguard's, are investor-friendly by definition or the best selection of most of those who wish to own equities. I am in my soapbox now because the blatant wrongdoing that has occurred has betrayed the trust of so many millions of shareholders, hundreds of industry insiders had to know what was going on, yet none publicly said the word. It's like Elliot Spitzer and the whistleblowers who aided him to initiate a house cleaning. We urge fund directors to continue the job like the directors to out corporate America. These fiduciaries must now decide whether their job is to work for owners or for managers. Berkshire governance. True independence, meaning the willingness to challenge a forceful CEO where something is wrong or foolish is an enormously valuable trade and director. It is also rare the place to look for it's among high-grade people whose interests are in line with those of rank-and-file shareholders and are in line in a very big way. We've made that in search of Berkshire. We now have 11 directors, and each of them combined with members of their families owns more than $4 million of Berkshire stock. Moreover, all held major stakes in the Berkshire family for years in the case of 611 family ownership amounts to at least hundreds of millions and dates back to at least three decades. All 11 directors have purchased their holdings in the market just as you did. We've never passed out options to restrict their shares. Charlie and I love such honest to God ownership. After all, whoever washes a rental car. In addition, director fees at Berkshire are nom- nominal. As my son Howard periodically reminds me, thus the upside for Berkshire for all 11 is proportionately the same as the upside for any Berkshire shareholder and may always be. The downside for Berkshire directors is actually worse than yours because we carry in the directors and officers liability insurance. Therefore, if something really catastrophic happens on our directors watch, they are exposed to losses that would far exceed yours. <clears throat> The bottom line for directors, you win, they win big, you lose, you, they lose big. Our approach might be called owner capitalism. We know no better way to engender. True independence is structure does not guarantee perfect behavior. However, I have sat on boards of companies in which Berkshire had a huge stakes and remain silent as questionable proposal were rubber stamped. In addition to being independent, directors should have business savvy, a shareholder orientation, and general interest in company. The rest of these qualities is business savvy. And if it's lacking, the other two of little help. Many people who are smart, articulated, and admired have no real understanding of business. That's no sin. They may shine elsewhere, but they don't. Belong on a corporate board, similarly, I would be useless on a medical or scientific board, though I would likely be welcomed by chairman who wanted to run things this way. My name would dress up the list of directors, but I wouldn't even know enough to critically evaluate proposals. Moreover, to cloak my ignorance, I would keep my mouth shut if you can't imagine that. In fact, I could be replaced without loss by a potted plant. Last year, I, as we moved to change our board, I asked for self-nominations from shareholders who believed that they had the requisite qualities to be a our director. Despite the lack of either liability insurance or meaningful compensation, we received more than 20 Applications. Most were good coming from owner oriented individuals having family holdings of Berkshire worth well over $1 million after considering them. Charlie and I, with the concurrence of our incumbent directors, asked for shareholders who did not nominate themselves to join the board David Godesman, Char- Charlotte Gaiman, Don Kyo, and Tor Murphy. These four people are all friends of mine and other strengths while they bring an extraordinary amount of business talent to Berkshire's board. The primary job of our directors is to select. 
my successor either upon my death or disability or when I begin to lose my marbles. David Oglivy had it right when he said, develop your eccentricities when young. That way, when you get older, people won't think you're going gaga. Charlie's family in mind feel that we overreacted to David's advice. At our director's meeting, we covered the usual run of housekeeping matters, but the real discussion, both would be in the room and Amson Center, is in the strength and weakness of the four internal candidates to replace me. Our board knows that the ultimate scorecard is performance will be determined by the record of my successor. He or she will need to maintain Breakers' culture, allocate capital, and keep a group of Americans' best managers happy in their jobs. This isn't a tough task, task in the world. The train is already moving at a good clip down the track, and I'm totally comfortable about it, being done well by any of the four candidates we have identified. I have more than 99% of my net worth in Breakers' and will be happy to have my wife or foundation, depending on the order in which she and I die, continue this concentration. Sector, sector results. As manager Charlie and I want to give our owners financial information commentary we would wish to receive, if our roles were reversed to do this, with both clarity and reasonably brevity, become more difficult as Berkshire's scope widens. Some of our business have vastly different economic characteristics from others, which means that our consolidated statements with their jumble of figures make useful analysis almost impossible. On the following pages, therefore, we will present some balance sheets and earning figures from our four major categories of business, along with commentary about each. We particularly want you to understand the limited circumstances under which we will use debt since typically we shun it. We will not, however, inundate you with data that has no real value in calculating Breakshire's intrinsic value. Doing so would likely obfuscate the most important facts. One warning when analyzing Breakshire, be sure to remember that the company should be viewed as an unfolding movie, not a still photograph. Those who focus in the past only the snapshot of these sometimes reach erroneous conclusions. Insurance. Let's start with insurance, since that's where the money is, the foundation of funds we enjoy in our insurance operating system from float, which is money that doesn't belong to us, but that we temporarily hold. Most of our float arises because, one, premiums are paid up front through services we provide. Insurance protection is delivered over a period that usually covers year and two. Loss events that occur today do not always result in our immediately paying claims, so it sometimes takes years for losses to be reported. Think asbestos negotiation is settled. Float is wonderful. If it doesn't come at high price, the cost of float is determined by underwriting results, meaning how losses and expenses paid compared with premiums received, the property casualty industry as a whole regularly operates its financial underwriting loss and therefore often has a cost of float that isn't attractive. Overall, our results have been good. True, we've had five terrible years in which float costs us more than 10%, but in 18 of, 18 of the 37 years, Berkshire has been in the insurance business. We have operated an underwriting profit, meaning we are actually paid for holding money, and the quality of cheap money has grown far beyond what is dreamed it could it could when we entered the business in 1967. Year in float in a million dollars. Year, Geico. 1967, 1977, 1987, 1998, 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. January, <clears throat> January, 2009, Other insurance, 14,909, 15,166. 15,505, 20,000,21,31,87,107,455,458,69,95,943,1,239,2,21,71,1,500,8,7,998,27,000,8,71,35,500,8,41,24,44,212,420. Last year was a standout. Float reached record levels and it came without costs at all. Major segments contributed to Berkshire's $1.7 billion pre-tax underwriting profit. Our results have been exceptional for one reason. We have truly exceptional managers. Insurers sell a non proprietary piece of paper containing a non proprietary promise. Anyone can copy anyone else's product. No installed base. Key patents, critical real estate, or natural resource positions protects an insuring competitive position. Typically, brands do not met, mean much either. The critical variables, therefore, are in general brains, discipline, and integrity. Our managers have all these attributes in spade. Let's take a look at all these stars in their operations. Drill and Ray had been Breakshire's problem child in the years following our acquisition of Eden. 1998, unfortunately, it was 400 pound child and its negative impact on over- overall performance at large. That's behind us. Generally, it's fixed. Thanks to Joe Brandon, CEO, and his partner, Tad Montross, for that. When I wrote you last year, I thought that discipline had been restored to both underwriting and reserving and events during 2003 solidified my view. That does not mean we will never have setbacks or insurance to business that is certain to deliver blows from time to time, but under Joe and Tad, this operation will be a powerful engine driving Breakshire Future's profitability. 
generates financial strength and match among our insurers even as we stated 2003 further improved during the year. Many of the company's competitors suffered credit downgrades last year, leaving Genre and its sister operation of national indemnities the only AAA rated companies among the world's major insurers. When your insurers purchase reinsurance, they buy only a promise on whose validity may not be tested for decades and there are no promises in their insurance world equaling those offered by Genre and national indemnity. Furthermore, unlike most reinsurers, we retain virtually all the risk we assume. Therefore, our ability to pay is not dependent on the ability or willingness of others to reimburse. The independent financial strength would be enormously important when the industry experience the mega t- catastrophe it surely will know. Regulated regular leaders of our readers of our annual reports now of Ajit Jain it's incredible contributions to British prosperity over the past 18 years. He continued to port it on 2003 with a staff of only 23. Ajit runs one of the world's largest insurance operations specializing in mammoth and unusual risk. Often these involve assuming catastrophe risks, say the threat of a large California earthquake of a size greater than any other insurance can accept. This means Ajit's results, British will be lumpy. You should therefore expect this op- operation to have an occasional horrible year. Over time, however, you can be confident of a terrific results from this one-of-a-kind manager. Ajit writes some very unusual policies. Last year, for example, PepsiCo promoted a drawing that offered participants a chance to win a $1 billion prize, understandably. Pepsi wished to lay off this risk and, however, would the logical party assume it. So we wrote a $1 billion policy to retain the risk entirely for our own account because of the price. If one was one was payable over time, exposure and present value terms was $250 million. I'll helpfully suggest that any winner be paid one one dollar a year for a billion years, but that proposal didn't fly. The drawing was held on September 14. Ajit and held all, held their breath as the finalists in the contest. As we left happier than he, PepsiCo has renewed for a repeat contest in 2003. Geico was a fine insurance company when Tony Lisley took over as CEO in 1992. Now it is a great one. During his tenure, premium volume has <clears throat> increased from $2.2 billion to $8.1 billion, and our share of personal auto market has grown from 2.1 to 5.0%. More important, Geico has paired these gains with outstanding underwriting performance. Commercial. It's been 67 years since Leo Goodwin created a great business idea at Geico. When deciding to save policyholders significant money, go to geico.com or call 1 800 847 7536 to see what we can do for you. And a commercial. In 2003, both the number of inquiries come into Geico and its closure rate on these increased segments as a result of our preferred policyholder count grew 8.2% and our standard and non standard policies grew 21.4%. Geico's business growth creates a never ending need for more employees and facilities. Our most recent inspection announced in December is a customer service center. And I'm delighted to say Buffalo, Stan Lipsay, the publisher of Buffalo News, was instrumental in bringing the city and Geico together. The key figure in this matter, however, was Governor George Pataki. His leadership and tenacity are why Buffalo have 2,500 jobs. When our expansion is fully throttled, uh, rolled out, Stan, Tony Knight, along with Buffalo, thank him for his help. Berkshire Smaller Insurers had another terrific year. This group, run by Rod Aldrich, John Kitzer, Tom Nirne, Don Toll, and Don Worcester, increased its float by 41% while delivering an excellent underwriting profit. These men, though, operating in exciting ways, produced truly exciting results. We should point out again that in any given year, a company writing a long-tail insurance coverage is giving rise to claims that are often settled many years after a loss of causing event takes place. Can report almost any earnings that CEO desires to often the industry has reported wildly. In anchored figures, most misstating liabilities. Most of the mistakes have been innocent. Sometimes, however, they have been intentional. And our object to be on full investors, regulators, auditors, and actuaries have usually failed to prevent both varieties of misstatement. I have failed in occasion too, particularly in not spotting generates and waiting and reserving a few years back, not only that many were reported in accurate figures to you, but the errors also resulted, resulted in our paying very substantial taxes earlier than was necessary. Ah, uh, I told you last year, however, that I thought our current reserving was at appropriate levels. So far, the judgment is holding up. Here are the British pre tax and rate results of set by segment. Genre, I just business excluding retroactive contracts, a retroactive contracts, Geico, other primary total, gain loss in million dollars, 2003, one thousand one hundred forty five dollars 145 dollars 1,434, 387, 452, 74, 1,718 total. 2002, 1,393, 980, 403, 416, 32, 398 dollars total. These contracts were explained in page 10 of the 2002 annual World report available on the internet at www.breakshirehathaway.com. In brief, the segment contains a few jumbo policies that are likely to produce underwriting losses, which are capital also provide unusually large amounts of float. Regulated utility 
utility businesses. Through MidAmerican Energy Holdings, we own an 84.5% fully diluted interest in a wide variety of utility operations. The largest are Yorkshire Electricity and Northern Electric, whose $3.7 million electric its customers make it third largest distributors of electrical electricity in the UK. Two, MidAmerican Energy, which serves 689 times electric customers in Iowa. And three, Kern River Northern Industrial Pipelines, which carries 7.8% of the natural gas transport in the United States. British RSV partners who own the remaining 19.5%. Dave Sokol and Greg Abel, the world manager of the business, and Walter Scott, a longtime friend of mine, who introduced me to the company because of MidAmerican and subject to the Public Utility Holding Company Act, PUHCA. British House voting interest is limited to 9.9%. Walter has a controlling vote. Our limited voting interest forces to account for MidAmerican and our financial statements in an abbreviated manner instead of our fully including into assets, liabilities, revenues, and expenses in our statements. We record, record only one line entry in both our balance sheet and income account. It's likely that someday, perhaps soon, either PUHCA will be replaced or our accounting rules will change. Berkshire's consolidating figures would then take in all of MidAmerican, including the substantial debt it utilizes. The size of this debt, which is not now, nor will it be an obligation of Berkshire, is entirely appropriate. MidAmerican's diverse and stable utility operations serve that even under harsh economic conditions, aggregate earnings will be ample to very comfortably service all debt. At year end, $1.578 billion of Mid American's most junior debt was payable to Berkshire. This debt has allowed acquisitions to be financed without our three partners needing to increase their already substantial investment in Mid American. By charging 11% interest, Berkshire is compensated fairly for putting up the funds and need for purchase while our partners are spared the dilution of their equity interests. Mid American also owns a significant non utility business, Home Service of America, the second largest real estate broker in the country. Unlike our utility operations, this business is highly cyclical, but nevertheless, one we view enthusiastically. We have an exceptional manager, Ron Peltier, who, through both his acquisition and operational skills, is building a brokerage powerhouse. Last year, Home Service participated in $48.6 billion of transaction, a gain of $107.7 billion from 2002. About 23% of the increase came from our acquisition made during the year through our 16 brokerage firms, all of which retain their local entities we employ. In the next decades, as we continue acquire leading and localized operation. Here is a tidbit for fans of free enterprise. On March 31, 1990, today, electric utilities in the UK were denationalized. Northern Yorkshire had 6,800 employees. In function, these companies continue to perform. Now they employ 2,539, yet the companies are serving about the same number of customers as when they were government owned and are distributing more electricity. It is not, it should be noted, a triumph of the regulation. Prices and earnings continue to be regulated for your manner by the government just as they should be. It is a victory, however, for those who believe that. That profit motivated managers, even though they recognize that the benefits will largely flow to customers, will find efficiencies that government never will. Here's some key figures in mid American, mid -American operations. UK utilities, Iowa pipeline, home services, other net farmings before it, corporate interest tax, corporate interest other than to Berkshire, interest payments to Berkshire, tax, net earnings, earnings applicable to Berkshire, debt owned to others, debt owned to Berkshire, earning in million dollars, 2003, 289 dollars, 169, 261, 113. 144, 2002, 267, 241 dollars, 104, 70, 108, 1076, 125, 184, 251, 790, 192, 118, 100, 416 dollars, 380 dollars, 429 dollars, 10,296, 1,578. Three hundred fifty nine dollars one ten thousand two hundred eighty six one thousand seven hundred twenty eight includes interest paid to Berkshire net of related income tax of one hundred eighteen dollars in two thousand three and seventy five dollars in two thousand two. Finance and financial products. This sector includes a wide ranging group of activities. Here's some commentary on the most important. I mentioned a few opportunistic strategies and industrial AFX fixed income securities that have been quite profitable in the last few years. These opportunities come and go, and at present they are going. We spend their departure somewhat last year, thereby realizing twenty four percent of the capital gains we show in the table that follows. Though far from proof, these transactions involve no credit risk and are conducted in exceptionally liquid securities. We therefore finance the positions almost entirely. With borrowed money as the assets are reduced, so also are the borrowings. The smaller portfolio we now have means that in the near future, our earnings in this category will decline significantly. It will sound well asset and at some point we'll get another turn at the bat. A far less pleasant unwinding operation is taking place in general securities and trading and derivatives option we inherited when we purchased general insurance. When we began to liquidate general securities in early 2002, it had 23,218 outstanding tickets with 884 counterparties, some having names I couldn't pronounce, much less creditworthiness I could evaluate. Since then, the unit's managers have been skillful and diligent in unwinding positions. Yet a year and nearly two years later, we still had 7,580 tickets outstanding within 453 counterparties. As a country song laments, how can I miss you if you won't go away? The shrinking of this business has been costly. We've had a pre-tax losses of $173 million in 2002 and $99 million in 2003. These losses should be noted came from portfolio of contracts and full compliance 
compliance with GAAB had been regularly market to market with standard allowances for future credit loss and administrative costs. Moreover, our liquidation has taken place both in benign market. We have no credit loss of severe in an orderly manner. This is just the opposite of what might be expected if financial crisis forced a number of derivatives to dealers to cease operations simultaneously. For the derivatives experience in the Freddie Mac shenanigans of mind-blowing size and audacity that were revealed last year makes it a special of accounting in this arena to consider yourself wise up. No matter how financially sophisticated you are, you can't possibly learn from reading the disclosure documents of a derivative-intensive company, what risk lurk is deposit positions. Indeed, the more you know about derivatives, the less you will feel you can learn from disclosures normally preferred, pre- preferred for you. In the urban sports, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. And now it's confession time. I'm sure I could have saved you $100 million or so pre if I had acted more promptly to shut down general securities, both Charlie and I knew that at the time the general insurance manager that the derivatives business was attractive. Reported profits struck as an illusory, and we felt that the business carried sensible risk that could not effectively be measured or limited. Moreover, we know that any major problems, we don't know that any major that any major problem to operation in my experience would likely correlate with trouble to the financial insurance world that would affect Berkshire elsewhere. In other words, if the derivatives business were ever to need shorting up, it would command the capital and credit of Berkshire at just the time we could otherwise deploy those resources to use an advantage. A historical note, we had such an experience in 1970 where we were the victims of major insurance fraud. We could not determine for some time how much the fraud would ultimately cost us and therefore kept more funds and cash equivalents than we normally would have. Absent these precautions, we would have made larger purchases of stocks that were then extraordinarily cheap. Charlie would have moved slowly to close down January securities, no question about that. I, however, deterred. As a consequence, our shareholders are paying a far higher price than was intended to exit this business. Though we included generous sizable life and health insurance business in the insurance sector, we showed results for our giant's life and immunity business in the section. That's because this business in large part involves arbitraging money. Our annuities range from retail products sold directly in the internet to structured settlements that require us to make payments for 70 years or more to people severely injured in accidents. We realized some extra income in the business of accelerated principal payments received from certain fixed income securities. We had purchased discounts. This phenomenon's ended in earnings are therefore likely to be lower in the segment during the next few years. We have $604 million investment in Value Capital, partnership run by Mark Byrne. Um, Member of family that has helped Berkshire over the years in many ways. Berkshire is a limited partner and has no say in management of Mark's enterprise, which has specialized in highly hedged fixed income opportunities. Mark is a smart and honest, along with his family, and a significant investment in value. Because of the accounting abuses at Enron and elsewhere, rules will soon be instituted that are likely to require that values as in liabilities be consolidated on Berkshire's balance sheet. We regard this requirement as inappropriate, given that valuable liabilities, which usually are above $20 billion, are in no way ours. Or over time, other investors will join as partners in value. When enough need, the need for a consolidated value will disappear. We have told you in the past about Bricadia, the partnership we formed a few years ago with Lucadia to finance and manage the wind down of Finova, a bankrupt leading operation. The plan was that we would supply most of the capital and Lucadia would supply most of the brains, and that's the way it has worked. Indeed, Joe Steinberg and Ian Cumming, who together ran Lucadia, have done such a fine job in liquidating Finova's portfolio that $5.6 billion of guarantee would take on in connection with the transaction has been extinguished. The unfortunate my product of this fast payoff is that our future income will be much more reduced. Overall, Brukeja has made excellent money for us, and Joe and Ian have been traffic partners. Our leasing businesses are extra transportation equipment and CORT, office furniture. Both operations have had poor earnings during the past years. At a recession, demand had to drop considerably more than was anticipated. The German leaders interfere to expect a modest improvement in their earnings this year. Through our Clayton purchase, we acquired significant um, manufactured housing finance operation. Clayton, like others in this business, had traditionally securitized the, the loans and originated the practice, relieved stress on Clayton's balance sheet, but a byproduct was the front ending of income result dictated by the GAAP. We are in no hurry to record income, have enormous balance sheet, strength, and believe that over the long term, the economics of holding our consumer paper is superior to what we can now realize through securitization. So Clayton has begun to retain its loans. We believe it's appropriate to finance a soundly selected book of interest bearing receivables, voluntarily with that just as a blank would. Therefore, Berkshire will borrow money for the finance Clayton's portfolio and reload these funds to Clayton under a cost plus one percentage point. This markup fairly compensates Berkshire for putting its exceptional credit worthiness to rig, but it still delivers money to Clayton at an attractive price. In 2003, in Berkshire, Berkshire did $2 billion of just borrowing and relending, with Clayton using much of this money to fend several large purchases of portfolios from lenders exiting the business. A portion of our loans to Clayton also provided catch up funding for paper it had generated earlier, and the year from it owned operations and had found it difficult to securitize. You may wonder why we borrow money while sitting on a mountain of cash. It's because of our every tub on its own bottom philosophy. We believe that any sort of superior lending money should pay an appropriate rate for the funds needed to carry its receivables and should not be subsidized by its parents. Otherwise, having rushed to add, it can lead to sloppy decisions. Meanwhile, the cash 
We accumulate the Berkshire as a testing for business acquisitions or for the purchase of securities that offer pertinence for significant profit. Clayton's load portfolio will likely to grow at least $5 billion in not too many years and with sensible credit standards in place should deliver significant earnings. For simplicity's sake, we include all the Clayton earnings in the sector to a sizable portion as derived from areas other than consumer finance. Trading, ordinary income, general security, life and annuity operation, value capital, breakage, leasing operations, manufactured housing, finance, clade, and other income for capital gains, trading capital gains total. Pre-tax earnings, 2003, $379, $99, $99, $99, $31, $101, $34, $37, $87, $88, $89, $90, $91, $92, $93, $94, $95, $96, $97, $98, $99, $100, $101, $102, $103, $104, $105, $105, $105, $105, $105, $105, $
victory. President Kennedy told us after the debate of pig disaster that has a thousand fathers, but defeat is an orphan. At NFM, we knew we had a winner of month after Bofo opening in Kansas City when our new store attracted an expected paternity claim. A speaker you're referring to the Blumkin family asserted they had enough confidence in the policy of the administration were working treasures they were able to provide. Work for 1,000 of our fellow citizens. The proud papa at the podium, President George W. Bush, and flight services. Flight safety or training operational experience to drop in normal operating earnings from $183 million to $150 million. Abnormal so in 2002, we had a $60 million pre-tax gain from the sale of a partnership interest to Boeing. And in 2003, we received recognized $37 million lost timing from the premature obsolescence of simulators. The corporate aviation business has slowed significantly in the past few years, and this fact has hurt flight safety's results. The company continues, however, to be far and away the leader in its field. And civilian leaders have an original cost of $1.2 billion, which is more than triple the cost of those operated by close competitors. Net dress or fractional ownership operation lost $41 million pre-tax in 2003. The company had a modest operating profit in the U.S., but this was more than offset by a $32 million loss of aircraft inventory and by continued loss in Europe. That just continues to dominate the fractional ownership of field and its leads in its increasing prospect overwhelmingly turned us rather than to other three major competitors. Last year, among the four of us, we accounted for 70% of that sales measured by value. An example of what sets NetJet apart from competitors are main clinic, executive travel response program, a free benefit enjoyed by all of our owners on land or in air anywhere in the world at any hour of the day. Our owners and their families have an immediate link to Mayo. Should an emergency occur while they are traveling here or abroad, Mayo will instantly direct them to an appropriate doctor or hospital. Any baseline data about the patient that may have possessed a simultaneously made available to the treating physician. Many owners have already found the service invaluable, including one who needed emergency brain surgery in Eastern Europe. The $30 million inventory write-down we took in 2003 occurred because of the falling prices for used aircraft early in the year. Specifically, we bought back fractions from the drawing owners at prevailing prices, and these fell in value before we were able to market them. Prices are no stable. European loss is painful, but any company that forsakes Europe, as all four competitors have done, is a sin for second-year status. Many of our U.S. owners flex extensively in Europe and want to safety and security shared by a NetJet's plane and the pilots. Despite the slow start, furthermore, we are now adding European customers at a good pace. During the years 2001 through 2003, we had gains of 88%, 61%, and 77% in European management and flying revenues. We have not, however, yet succeeded in stemming the flow of red ink. Rich Santuli and Adjustic shortly should you know, expect our European loss to diminish in 2004 and also anticipate there will be more than offset by U.S. profits overwhelmingly. Our owners love the NetJet experience once a customer has tried it's going back to commercial aviation. is like going back to holding hands. <coughs> NetJets will become a very big business over time and will be one in which we are prominent in both customer satisfaction and profits. Rich will cheat to that. Investments. The table that follows show our common stock investments. Those had a market value of more than $500 million at the end of 2003 are... And itemized shares: one hundred fifty-one million six hundred ten thousand seven hundred two hundred million ninety-six million fourteen thousand six hundred ten million fifteen fifteen million four hundred seventy-six thousand five hundred six million seven hundred eight thousand seven hundred sixty twenty-four million two. Billion three hundred thirty eight million nine hundred sixty one thousand one million seven hundred twenty seven million a thousand seven hundred sixty five fifty six million four hundred forty eight thousand three hundred eighty company American Express Company the Coca Cola Company Gillette Company H and R Block Incorporated H A Incorporated M N T Bank Corporation Moody's Corporation Petro China Company Limited the Washington Post Champion. Each company, Wells Fargo and Company, others, total common stock. Percentage of company owned 11.8, 8 .8, 8.2, 9.5, 8.2, 3.1, 5.6, 16.1, 1.3, 18.1, 3.3, 12, 31.03. Cost one thousand four hundred seventy dollars, one thousand two hundred ninety nine, six hundred two hundred twenty seven, four hundred ninety two, one hundred three, four hundred ninety nine, four hundred eighty eight, eleven, four hundred sixty three, two thousand eight hundred sixty three, eight thousand five hundred fifteen. Market seven thousand three hundred twelve. 10,150, 3,526, 809, 665, 659, 1,453, 1,340, 1,367, 3,324, 4,682, 35,287. We bought some most Fargo shares last year, otherwise among our six largest holdings. We last changed our opposition to Coca-Cola in 1994, American Express in 1998, Gillette in 1989, Washington Post in 1973, and Moody's in 2000 brokers don't love us. We are neither enthusiastic nor negative about portfolio we hold. We own pieces of excellent business, all of which had good gains and intrinsic value last Last year, but their current prices reflect your excellence. The unpleasant corollary to this conclusion is that I made a big mistake in not selling several of our larger holdings during the Great Bubble. If these stocks are fully priced now, you may wonder what I was thinking. Four years ago, when their intrinsic value was lower, and their prices far higher, so do I. In 2002, junk bonds became very cheap, and we purchased about $8 billion of these. The pendulum swung quickly, though, and the sector now looks decidedly unattractive to us. Yesterday's sweets are today being priced as flowers. 
We have repeatedly emphasized that realized gains at Berkshire are meaningless for analytical purposes. We have a huge amount of unrealized gains in our books and are thinking about when and if the cash doesn't depend on not all desired to report earnings to one specific time or another. Nevertheless, to see diversifier of investment activities, you may be interested in the following table categories the gains we reported during 2003. Category, common stocks, U.S. government bonds, junk bonds, foreign exchange contracts, other pre-tax gain in million dollars, $448, 1485 1138 $825, $233, $4,129. The common stock pro- profits occurred around the edges of our portfolio, not as well as we already mentioned from our selling down. Our major positions to profits and government arose from our liquidation of long-term strips, the most volatile of government securities, and from certain strategies I will follow within our finance, our financial products division, we retained most of our junk portfolios, selling... Only a few issues called in maturing bonds accounted for the rest of the gains in junk category. During 2002, we entered the foreign currency market for the first time in my life. In 2003, we launched our position. As I became increasingly bearish on the dollar, I should note that the seven share for Sears has a huge section aside, aside from Miracle Forecasters. We have, in fact, made a few of Miracle Forecasters at Berkshire, and we have helped them seem others make them in sustained success. We have had and will continue to have the bulk of Berkshire's net worth in U.S. assets, but in recent years, our country's trade deficit has been forced feeding huge amounts of claims on and ownership of America and the rest of the world. For the time, foreign appetite for these assets rather absorbed the supply. Late in 2002, however, the world started choking on the side and the dollar value began to slide against major currencies. Events of prevailing exchange rates will not lead to material let up in our trade deficits. So whether foreign investors like it or not, they will continue to be flooded with dollars. The consequences of this are anybody's guess. They could, however, be troublesome and reach in fact well beyond currency markets. As an American, I hope there is benign ending to this problem. I saw suggested an impossible solution, which is incidentally leaves Charlie called in November 10, 2003, Chargical and Fortune magazine. Then again, perhaps the alarms have raised will prove needless. Our country's dynamism and resiliency have repeatedly made fools of naysayers, but Berkshire holds many villains of cash equivalents of in dollars, so I feel more comfortable owning foreign exchange contracts that are the least partial offset to that position. These contracts are subject to accounting rules that accrue changes in their value to the contemporaneously included in the capital gains or losses, even though the contracts have not been closed. We show these changes each quarter in the financial financial product segment of our earnings statement. At year-end, our open foreign exchange contracts sold about $12 billion in market value and were spread among five currencies. Also, when we were purchasing junk bonds in 2002, we tried to, when possible, to, to buy issues denominating euros. Today, we own about $1 billion of these. When we can't find anything exciting in which to invest our default position in U.S. U.S. treasuries, both bills and repos, no matter how low the yields on these instruments go, we never reach for a little more income by dropping our credit standards or by extending maturities. Shortly, I detest taking even small risk unless we feel we are being inadequately compensated for doing so. About as far as we will go down that path that is occasionally eat cottage cheese a day after expiration date on the card in. A 2003 book that investors can learn much from is Bull by Maggie Mahar. Two other books that recommend The Smartest Guy in the Room by Beth Bethany McLean and Peter Elkin, and in Any Uncertain World by Bob Rubin. All the three are well reported and well written. Additionally, Jason Zweig last year did a first class job in revising The Intelligent Investor, my favorite book on investing. Designated gift program. From 1991 through 2002, Berkshire administered a program whereby shareholders could direct Berkshire to make gifts to their favorite charitable organizations. Over the years, we dispersed $187 million pursuant to this program. Churches were the most frequently named designees, and many thousands of other organizations benefited as well. We were the only major public company to offer such a program to shareholders, and Charlie and I were proud of it. We were looking to terminate the program in 2003 because of controversy over the abortion issue. Over the years, numerous organizations on both sides of this issue had been designated by our shareholders to receive contributions. As a result, we regularly received some objections to the gift designated for poor choice operations. A few of these came from people and organizations that proceeded to boycott products over subsidiaries that did not concern us. We refused all requests to limit the right of our owners to make whatever gift they chose, as long as their recipients had 501c3 status. In 2003, however, many independent associates of the pamper shop began to feel the boycotts. This development meant that people who trusted us, but who were neither employees of ours nor had a voice in Berkshire decision-making, suffered serious loss of income. For our shareholders, there was some modest tax efficiency in Berkshire doing the given razor, then they were making their gifts directly. Additionally, the program's consistent with our partnership approach the first principle set forth in our owner's manual, but these advantages failed when they were measured against damage done loyal associates who had, with great personal effort, built business of their own. Indeed, Charlie and I see nothing charitable in her decent, hardworking people just so we and other shareholders can gain some minor tax efficiencies. Berkshire now makes no contributions to the parent company level. Our various subsidiaries follow philanthropic policies consistent with their practice prior to their acquisition by Berkshire, except that any personal contributions that former owners had earlier made from their corporate pocketbook are now funded by them personally. 
the annual meeting. Last year, I asked you to vote as well as you wished our annual meeting to be held on Saturday or Monday. I was hoping for Monday, Saturday 1 by 2 to 1. It will be a while before shareholder democracy or services break share. But you have spoken and we will hold this year's annual meeting on Saturday, May 1 at the new QS Center in downtown Omaha. The QS offers as 194,000 square feet for exhibition by our subsidiaries from 65,000 square feet last year and much more seating capacity as well. The QS doors will open at 7 a.m. The move will begin at 8.30 and the meeting itself will commence at 9.30. There will be a short break at noon for food. Sanders will be available to QS concession stand. That in turn will decide Charlie and I will answer questions until 3.30. We'll tell you everything we know and at least in many cases more. more. Attachment to the proxy material that is enclosed with its report explains how you can obtain credential you will need for admission to the meeting and other events. As for plane, hotel, and car reservation, we have again signed up American Express 800-799-6634 to give you special tip. They do a terrific job for each share, and I thank them for it. In our usual fashion, we're in... We will run bands from the largest hotel to the meetings. Afterwards, events will make trips back to the hotels and to Nebraska for insurance mark, board and the airport, even so you are likely to find the car useful. Our exhibition of Brickshire goods and service will blow you away this year. On the foot, for example, will be 1,600 square foot Clayton home featuring Acme brick, show carpet, John's Manville installation, Meetech fasteners, carefree awnings, and outfitted with Anama furniture. You'll find it a far cry from mobile, fo- mobile home stereotype of a few decades ago. Geico will have a booth staffed by a number of its top counselors from around the country. All of them ready to supply you with auto insurance quotes. In most cases, GEICO will be able to give you a special shareholder discount, usually 8%. The special offer is permitted by 41 of the 49 jurisdictions in shop we operate. Bring the details of your existing insurance and check out whether we can save you money. On Saturday at the Omaha Airport, we will have the usual area of aircraft from NetJets available for your inspection. Stop by the NetJets booth at QS to learn about viewing these planes if you buy what we consider an appropriate number of items during the weekend. You may only need your own plane to make them home. At the Nebraska Furniture Mart located on a 77-acre site on 72nd Street between Dodge and Pacific, we will again be having Brickshire weekend pricing, which means we'll be offering our shareholders a discount that's customarily given only to employees. We initiated this special pricing at FM7 years ago and sales during the weekend grew from $5.3 million to nineteen ninety. to $17.3 million in 2003 every year has set a new record. To get this discount, you must make your purchase between Thursday, April 29 and Monday. Make sure you include an also present your meeting credential. The period special pricing will even apply to the products of several prestigious manufacturers that normally have uncut rules against discounting, but that, in the spirit of our shareholder, we can have made an exception for you. We appreciate your cooperation. NFM is open from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Saturday and 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Sunday. On Saturday this year from 5.30 p.m. to 8 p.m., we are having a special affair for shareholders only. I'll be there eating barbecue and drinking Coke. Borsheim's the largest jewelry store in the country except for Tiffany's Manhattan store. We'll have two shareholders only events. The first will be a cocktail reception from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. on Friday, April 30. The second, the main gala, will be from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Sunday, May 2. Ask Charlie to autograph your sales tickets. Shareholder prices will be available Thursday through Monday, so if you wish to avoid the large crowds that will assemble on Friday evening and Sunday, come on the other times and identify yourself as a shareholder. On Saturday, we'll be open until 6 p.m. Borsheim to operate in a gross margin that is full, 20 percentage points below that of its major rival. So the more you buy, the more you save. At least that's what my wife and daughter tell me. Both were impressed early in life by the story of the boy who, after missing a streetcar, walked home and proudly announced that he had saved five cents doing so, so his father was irate. Why didn't you miss a cab and save 85 cents? In the mall outside of Bursheims, we will have Bob Hammond and Sharon Osberg, two of the world's top bridge experts available to pay our shareholder. On Sunday afternoon, additionally, Patrick Wolf, twice U.S. chess champion, will be in the mall talk, taking all comers blindfolded. I watch and he doesn't peek. Gord's, my favorite steakhouse, will again be open exclusively for Brickshire shareholders on Sunday. May 2 and will be serving from 4 p.m. until 10 p.m. Please remember that to come to Gord's on Sunday, so you must have reservation to make one call. 402 on April 1, but not before. If Sunday is sold out, try Gord's on one of the other evenings you will be in town. Flaunt your mastery fine dining by ordering as I do. Order a team on with a double order of hash browns. We'll have a special reception Saturday afternoon from 4 to 5 for shareholders who come from outside of North America every year, our meeting draws many people from around the world globe, and Charlene and I want to be sure we personally meet those who have come so far. Any shareholders who come from other than the U.S. or Canada will be given a special credential instruction for attending this function. Charlene and I have a great time at the annual meeting, and you will too, so join us at QOS for Animal Woodstock for Capitalist. February 27, 2004, Warren E. Buffett, Chairman of the Board.